Hi, I am Giulio Zanoni. I'm here to talk to you about the topic to which I've devoted most of my work, and that is understanding consciousness and some of its implications for meaning and our place in nature. Let me first say what I mean by consciousness. Consciousness is what it is like to be me. To be conscious is to have an experience, to see, hear, feel, think, imagine, and even dream. We usually take consciousness for granted, except maybe when we begin to fear death. But it is worth reminding ourselves that for each of us, consciousness is all there is. If we lose consciousness, say we hit our head or simply fall into a dreamless sleep, then as far as we are concerned, there is nothing at all. Not us, not the world around us. And for each of us, what we experience here and now is the only thing that truly exists. Now, this is not what current science teaches us. We we'll learn about planets and stars and the vastness of the universe and that it is all made of matter and energy, and that we are mere specks of matter relegated to a far provincial corner of the cosmos, flickering for just an instant. Before science, we thought that we were at the center but we have now undergone a cosmic displacement. We have also undergone an evolutionary displacement. Rather than being the pinnacle and purpose of creation, we now know that we are the product of chance and blind selection. And lately we are undergoing a third neuroscientific displacement. We have learned how our brain does many of the remarkable things it does, from recognizing objects to speaking and driving cars, but we have also learned that in the end, it is just a machine, a biological machine for sure, but a machine nevertheless. There is no essential soul inhabiting it as pre-scientific spiritual traditions would have us believe. And we are now rapidly moving towards a final displacement, an AI displacement. Not only are we biological machines, but we may soon be sidelined by artificial machines, machines that through deep learning and sheer computational power can do all we do, only better and more reliably. But if this, according to current science, is how things really are, if we are just a flickering universe, the product of chance and necessity, if consciousness is just a fairy tale ghost in the brain, soon to be dispelled and soon to be replaced by silicon machines. Then where is the meaning of what we see, feel, think and strive for, and which is all that truly exists for us? If consciousness is merely carried along for the ride by a machine that runs through its motions, doesn't everything become meaningless? Yet this is the conclusion that follows inexorably from the standard scientific ontology. By ontology, I simply mean the assumptions about what truly exists. And since Galileo, science has accepted as a dogma, and yes, science too has dogmas, that what exists is a universe of matter and energy, and that all natural phenomena should be accounted for on this basis. The problem is, this is an ontology that is extrinsic and has no room for consciousness because it excludes it from the start and not surprisingly can never recover it. And if we leave out consciousness from the catalog of what exists, neither can we recover true meaning and certainly not true freedom of the will. This is not just a cognitive dissonance between what we feel and what we know, it is a crisis a crisis that in this case is truly existential. Now, the good news. What I'm here to say is that the extrinsic ontology of current science is fundamentally wrong, and so are its conclusions. We need to get our ontology right and develop an intrinsic ontology, an ontology that in determining what exists starts from the only thing we know for sure that it exists, our own consciousness. Remember, without consciousness, there would be nothing at all. Not us, 
not the universe out there, the way we see it, and certainly not science. The good news is that if we fix our ontology and put consciousness in its right place, then our understanding of our place in nature also changes radically, and that of nature itself. Now, the work we have done over the years with many collaborators has led to a theory that derives its ontology, the essential properties of existence, from the only existence that is immediate and irrefutable, our own consciousness. The theory, called Integrated Information Theory, or IIT for short, translates the essential properties of consciousness in physical, that is, operational terms, where physical simply means what can be observed and done from within our consciousness, and then gives these properties mathematical form. IIT, as a scientific theory, can already explain why certain regions of the brain, like parts of the cerebral cortex up here, are critical for consciousness, while other parts, like the cerebellum back here, are not even though the cerebellum has five times more neurons than the cortex. It can explain the fading of consciousness when we are deeply asleep, its return when we dream, its vanishing during anesthesia and with certain lesions of the brain. In fact, it has led to tools to assess the presence of consciousness in unresponsive patients with unmatched sensitivity and specificity. And it can begin to explain not only when we are conscious and when not, but also why consciousness feels the way it does, why space feels extended and time flowing. In short, the theory shows that if we start from consciousness in itself, then subjectivity can be understood objectively. Now, while I will not go into IIT or the neuroscience supporting it, I want to point out some of its implications that are relevant for the existential crisis, the crisis of meaning to which I've referred. If the theory is on the right track, then it takes a very special kind of physical substrate, as we find in certain parts of our brain, to truly exist as a vast, rich, conscious entity. Other physical substrate, be they as large as a mountain or a star, cannot exist intrinsically for themselves. There is nothing it is like to be there. They only exist for a conscious observer like us. By themselves, they reduce to clouds of dust. In fact, if the theory is right, the four displacement brought about by science reverse completely, and with them, our understanding of our place in nature. First, far from being a minuscule flicker among giant stars and galaxies, we are the largest kind of entity in the known universe. Nothing we know is likely to exist as vastly and brightly as each individual human consciousness. Second, far from being carried along for the ride by our neurons, we truly exist, not them. We, not brain circuits, have meanings, choices, reasons, values and purposes. Indeed, all meaning is conscious meaning. The meaning is the feeling, and the feeling is the meaning. And meanings are structures of integrated information, extraordinary structures. Every experience, even that of a dark sky, or of time silently flowing, is a structure immensely richer than the most majestic of cathedrals. And truth, goodness, beauty, justice, and freedom are just such forms, hopefully forms that exist in the mind of each of us as long as we think of them. Third, it follows from the theory that you have true free will. We are the ones who decide, cause, and have responsibility. Nothing else does. Far from being the mere product of chance and natural selection, we are very much the makers of who we become. And finally, far from being replaced by super-intelligent machines, we must realize that no matter how intelligent they seem, they are also just a handful of dust. 
No matter whether they may soon write and draw and play better than most artists, perhaps show greater empathy than our best friends, they do not exist for themselves, but only for us as tools. It is not about doing, but about being. And to be is to be conscious. If this view is right, then consciousness itself, each individual soul, is the true sun illuminating nature. A sun that creates meaning, value and purpose.